We have wall to wall breaking news this entire hour on two stories that could not be more different. One of them is that hyper mysterious UFO sighting in Las Vegas almost one year ago. You will not believe the fallout, what's happened in this last year. And the huge update that I have for you tonight people are finally talking publicly. And we've got a special report on all of that. But there is also this other massive breaking news today, a mystery that's far more recent, the cold-blooded murders of those two Kansas women in the Oklahoma panhandle. And this bombshell tonight has a name. He has actually um, been called a few different names in the past week and a half. We have called him suspect number five. We have called him the mystery misfit. And we have also called him the single biggest unanswered question since the other four suspects were arrested. But tonight, Paul Grice is something different. Tonight, Paul Grice is an inmate of the Texas County Jail, just like his alleged co-conspirators. And just like them, he is charged with the murder, conspiracy, and kidnapping of Veronica Butler and her child visitation supervisor, Jillian Kelly. And just like Grandma Tiffany Adams, the woman who allegedly put this double murder plot into motion, Paul Grice supposedly confessed to the investigators. News Nation senior national correspondent Brian Enton spent a week in Oklahoma tracking down information about Paul Grice, and he joins me now live. All right, so this was such massive news today. Uh, we wondered if it would happen. And then all of a sudden it did, but we had no sort of heads up. Talk to me about the warrant that was issued and the fact that he confessed. Yeah, so we know that there has been a massive police investigation ongoing behind the scenes. They've been tight-lipped. They haven't wanted to tell us very much about it, but they have been clear that it is an ongoing investigation, and they have had eyes on Paul Grice, uh, Ashley. And we know yesterday, we've confirmed through sources, uh, that they were out at Paul Grice's house, they were interviewing him, and there was this confession. Uh, and it was not a wishy-washy uh, sort of word salad confession than like what we saw with Grandma Tiffany. It was a much clearer confession. Uh, it happened yesterday when they were out at his house doing the interview. Today the arrest came. Then the mugshot, which you see right there uh, on your screen. He's in the Texas County Jail. Uh, we are going to, we've got the full confession. We've got it all in black and white. Uh, I'm going to read it to you coming up a little bit later in the show. Okay, then also uh, the big deal with the other four was how to keep them separated in a jail that houses about, you know, a little under 100 people. You have four, now five defendants that are not allowed to meet or chat or get their story straight. I guess they're going to have to figure out now how to put that fifth Paul Grice into that jail without mixing with the other two males. Yeah, and it's not a big jail. I mean, you've done reporting about the layout of the jail, so they've got to come up with a way now to keep them separate, which we're told they have figured out how to do that. But they all know each other, and they know other people in the community, too. I mean, everybody knows them, which is a challenge now that they're all in the county jail uh, to make sure that they, that they aren't able to communicate. You know, when they bring them in, they don't bring them all in together for these court hearings we saw last time. Uh, they bring them in one by one, again, for that reason. They do not want them communicating. They don't even let them uh, stay in the same courtroom at the same time together. So it, it's going to be a challenge uh, housing them all. That's for sure, Ashley. I'm still confused about it. I don't know if you have the answers, or I certainly don't think that they're going to tell us these answers. But Paul Grice was hauled in. He was detained. He was questioned. And he was released weeks ago. So all of a sudden, what changed? Why now? Why all of a sudden an arrest? And then exact same charges as the other four. Yeah, and it's, it's interesting you said detained because that's true. When he was brought in the first time, when they brought in the other four suspects, he didn't just go in willingly to talk to, talk to police. They brought him in almost like they were going to arrest him. They interviewed him, but then they let him go, which was very, very confusing uh, to people in the community. Didn't understand, especially when you read the arrest affidavit and it said in the affidavit that he was uh, involved. A lot of people were giving him the benefit of the doubt, saying, let's see how this plays out with law enforcement. Uh, and we don't, was it someone who spoke behind bars? Was is, is Grandma Tiffany talking, said something else that was enough evidence to push things forward? Uh, but also remember, they got the confession yesterday. They got the confession from Paul Grice, uh, and it seems like that's what sealed the deal for them to actually make the arrest.
Oh, something tells me they got some evidence on him, too, yeah. and brought him back and said, you want to change your story? Because Grandma Tiffany said this about you. You may have said this about her, but now we have some evidence to back it up. Now what's your story? Well, who knows, you know, and maybe he just opened the spigots to try to save his neck. Literally, this is a death penalty state, so any of these five that runs to the DA first and, and begs mercy and opens up, you know, the, the, the dam of information might fare a little better. I say yeah. might. Not necessarily. So the other big thing, and this is so upsetting, um, we're going to have this conversation later, but you learned some information from the medical examiner today that cleared up something that everyone thought, turns out it didn't happen at the murder scene. Tell me what you learned. Yeah, so we have confirmed, Ashley, uh, that the two victims, uh, Jillian and Veronica, were not shot. Uh, we still do not know mm. the official cause of death, but it was not a gunshot wound and they were not shot, uh, which is pretty disturbing when you think about it, uh, how barbaric this murder may have been. I mean, we've reported that there were uh, pools of blood near where, where the car was found. Um, exactly how did it happen if it wasn't a gunshot? Uh, that's what we've been looking into, all of the different theories, and that's what we're going to talk about uh, later in the show, Ashley. Yeah, just let's remember there was a broken hammer and pools yeah. of blood found outside. of. So this had to be just the most traumatic, the most terrifying, I dare say torturous kind of death, hand-to-hand um, -hand combat, just awful. Uh, Brian, you're going to stick around. We're, gonna, we're doing two big breaking stories tonight, so you're going to have all those details for the affidavit. You're going to read that confession. Yeah. You're going to read all that information um, and have this discussion about the, the murder scene as well. All that coming up in a bit. So thank you for that. Meantime, I do have to move on to this because we had this other massive story. Um, it actually began with a flash in the sky about a year ago. It was a bright light in a place that is synonymous with bright lights, Las Vegas. Any light that can stand out in Vegas is big. But if you remember our coverage at the time, you know why this one got so much attention. It was caught on a police officer's body cam at about 10 minutes to midnight. 39 minutes later, a call came into 911, reporting two mysterious beings, each of them described as 10 feet tall with, quote, big, shiny eyes and big mouths. It was a family who said that was what was in their backyard. This is how they reported it. Take a look. There's like an eight-foot person beside it, and another one's inside, and it has big eyes and looking at us, and it's still there. Okay, where is this on your property? Uh, uh, in my backyard. I swear to God, this is not a joke. This is actually we so just two, we terrify it. So there's two people or two subjects that are in your backyard. Correct, and they're very large. They're okay. like eight foot, nine feet, ten foot. I don't know. They're, they look like they look like aliens to us. Big eyes. They have big eyes. Okay. Like like I can't explain it. And big mouth. They're shiny eyes and and they're not human. They're hundred percent they're not human. Okay. So you can hear the 911 dispatcher, okay, well, that might be someone's reaction, right? But the family captured the moment on video. They went out to investigate the scene for themselves before something clearly scared them off from the backyard. Take a look. You know, the Metro Police uh, took this call very seriously, even commenting on their own nerves and making note of the flash that they had seen in the sky just minutes earlier. Take a look. I'm so nervous right now. I have butterflies, bro. Uh, Everyone thought a shooting star. Then these people say there's aliens in their backyard. I called. I was on the other side. I was helping my dad to clean the... On, the, on that side of the house? On the, on the other side, yeah, in the backyard. Because we're working on a truck. We work on a truck and um, we were checking. Okay, we were working. We were cleaning everything, put everything inside the little garage we had. Mm -hmm. Me and my brother, we just Did looked. Did you see it? Huh? Did you see it? Yeah, me and him saw it. What did you see? It was like a 
It was like a big creature. A big creature? Yeah, like a long ten feet tall. I'm not going to BS you guys. One of my partners said they saw something fall out of the sky too, so that's yes. why I'm kind of curious. Not only did what happened in Vegas not stay in Vegas, it circled the known universe. The frenzy grew when reports surfaced that unknown authorities had afterwards placed cameras around this family's home. The family was driven into hiding, off the grid, out of sight, underground. But 10 months later, the mystery lives on and looky-loos and alien hunters are still on the prowl. The family posted no trespassing signs, but break-ins have been reported frequently here as recently as last week at this home. Tonight, a News Nation exclusive, the teenager who made that 911 call is finally speaking publicly at length and laying out exactly what he saw that night and what has happened since. Our national correspondent, Alex Capriello, joins me with that live from Las Vegas tonight. So, Alex, it's really compelling with the advent of a year passing almost, that they've had a chance to digest mm -hmm. what it is they've been through. They have kept quiet. They are not looking for attention. And yet now you're getting information, especially from this 15-year-old or the 17-year-old, that's, um, that, that's pretty alarming. Yeah, and I've found out from speaking to Angel Kenmore that life just really has not been all that easy for the past year since they saw that 10-foot-tall creature in their backyard right here behind me. For him, he says that he's plain and simple traumatized by it all. He says he can't sleep at night. He's become slightly paranoid. He cries at night trying to make sense, heads or tails, of what exactly he saw that night, playing it back over and over in his head. You can imagine uh, the torment that's going through in his head. But to this day, none of the family has a very good explanation about what exactly they saw that night. But to their credit, they've stayed pretty consistent about the facts and the details. I really grilled him about that, trying to get him to remember as much as he possibly could about that night. Here's a portion of our conversation. What do you remember about that night? What do you remember seeing? Oh, um, uh, sorry, dug in, I guess. Um, we were, we were in the backyard fixing a truck and then out of nowhere we just see a big light fall down and basically crash in the backyard. And, um, moments after, like, not so, like a couple of seconds after, I saw the big giant creature in front of me. The alien, whatever you guys want to call it. The alien demon, whatever you guys want to call it. What do you believe it is? A demon. A demon? Yeah. So maybe that's changed, that once you thought it was an alien, now you believe it was a demon. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know what it is, you know. Only God knows what it was. But I'm thinking it's like something bad, you know, not a good thing. Was it moving? Was it doing? Yes, it was moving. It was, you could see, like, he was breathing, like he was, like, like pissed off. Like he wanted to do something. And he was looking at you and yeah. your brother? Yeah, he was looking at me, yeah. Did he say anything? Mm-mm. Well, I, I remember he was growling, like a dog, like, ah, like he was growling. When did it end? Um, as soon as I closed my eyes, I guess. I don't know, I think I was praying or something like that, and they just let me go. That's when I went inside, and, you know, I saw my dad. I, mean, I saw it, too. It Everybody felt like it had a control of your body? Oh, yeah, I couldn't move. I couldn't move, yeah. You were paralyzed at the sight of this thing. Yeah, I couldn't move. And you were looking at it for 30 or so seconds, and then... All of a sudden it was gone? Yeah. That was pretty creepy. A lot of people think that that's just hard to believe. They, you know, like I said again, they can think whatever they want. What do you say to the people who believe that your family just made this whole thing up to try to get attention? They can believe whatever they want, you know. I'm not, I'm not doing it for free. If I did it for fame, I would be on YouTube and stuff like that, doing more videos. But I don't care, guys. I just went on TikTok and YouTube, made my story. That's pretty much it. I made no money off this. I want people to know that I made no money off this. I don't need money. That's pretty much it. They can believe whatever they want. I bet you hope it doesn't happen to anybody. Oh, no, hopefully not, no. I hope God, no. Really bad experience. Really traumatizing. And Ashley, I don't know uh, what your impression of him was, but when I was speaking to him personally, I was really struck by how confident and authentic he was about his memories of that night. There's a lot of people obviously out there in the world that would make up ghost stories in order to chase any sort of clout or fame. But to me, Angel came across as somebody who truly believed that he saw something that night in that backyard right here behind me.
Yeah, Alex, he didn't really seem to have canned answers either. So if this was all a big ruse, he's either a really, really good actor. I mean, Meryl Streep quality. Um, and, you know, he certainly didn't script it, didn't seem to plan out answers, uh, you know, at the grasp. I do want to ask you about the family. You know, this is the 17-year-old finally talking at length about his experience. And he, boy, did he ever add some details there that the what he saw seemed to be angry and breathing heavily with growling, looking right yeah. at his brother and him, and that he felt frozen, which is an account we've heard from right. other people who have felt that they've seen something out of this world before, that they've been frozen and unable to move. What about the family? Does the family back him? Yeah, the family does, although they're much less willing to go public about it. I spoke to his mom, who basically said that she has no interest in speaking about it because she just feels differently than Angel. She feels like nobody in the world is going to believe her. Angel, on the other hand, while certainly not trying to publish his case uh, widespread, he feels the need to share it because he wants the world to know what he saw, and also he wants uh, the world to know that his family is doing okay and moving forward. Uh, in general, the family wants the spotlight off of them, take for for example, all these no trespassing signs. There's at least four of them. Uh, but at this time, they are just basically saying, look, we don't really want to talk about it anymore, but we still stand behind the things that we saw that night. So what's interesting also, Alex, in the year, almost the year that has passed, is that something else has begun to happen, they say, now inside the home. And they're very um, afraid of what they have been, say, what they say that they have been witnessing inside their home. Can you describe what it is they're telling you? Yeah, and I think that's the reason why Angel has pivoted from calling what he saw that night an angel, uh, uh, an alien, ex instead now calling it a demon, because he feels like he's seen so much paranormal activity and just strange, unexplainable things happening inside of his home. There was uh, two anecdotes, one in particular that we're about to show you that literally made the hairs on my arm stand up, just because it is so freaky, so unexplainable. We have a segment of that port part of the conversation. You, you mentioned paranormal activity. What exactly did you see? Well, I was in another room. My brother called me, and there was an upside-down cross, and there was a Jesus statue in it. They ripped Jesus out of it, they threw him like, across the room, and it was floating upside down. Are you saying floating example. in the air? Yeah, like in the air. It was floating upside down. What did you do? I mean, did you go and pick it up? Did you knock it down? Like, how no, I didn't do nothing. I was just sitting there. I was crazy. I was like, what? But how did it come down? It's not still floating right now, is it? No, no, it came down. So we got closer to it, and then just dropped. It fell to the ground. A crucifix yeah. floating in the air, upside down. The Jesus on the crucifix had been ripped off, yeah. and it was floating. Yeah. And you can say definitively, without lies, that that is what you saw. Yes, yes. Sorry, God. That's what I saw. What do you believe that is? How, how could something like that happen? That's not physically possible in this world. And that's just one story of many stories of paranormal activity that's happened inside this house, according to Angel. Uh, he said that the family has had to take some really drastic measures to make themselves feel safe within their home. We're going to talk more about all of that paranormal activity tomorrow night on Banfield. And one last question about just what their house, um, you know, has become, because, you know, Typically, uh, people are, are, they are rabid about stuff like this, and people will come from all corners of not just the country but the earth to visit places like this. Have they right. been inundated with, um, with, with tourists and looky-loos and people who are not maybe um, as, as kind as they should be when they arrive on the property? Yeah, you bet. I mean, as you mentioned, this story sparked global attention. So everybody started coming to this house to get a peek at the backyard, hoping to catch a sight of a UFO or an alien or a demon, whatever it was back there. And so that's the reason why you see so many no trespassing signs. If you just look in the distance, you see one on the window. There's one on the garage. Uh, on their front door, there's a no trespassing sign, also a concealed carry uh, sign that says that, uh, you know, we will protect our property. So in the end, this is caught a lot of attention and so much so that they're seeing around four or five cars almost each and every day people stopping by people even jumping over the fence uh, breaking into their home trying to do whatever they can to catch a glimpse so distressing alex capriello thank you i know we've got more reporting ahead so i appreciate the time that you've taken out there uh, all this time after the instance itself thank you and you know we all know Thanks, that Anything can be faked in this day and age, right? Just like anything. But so too can it be investigated and dissected 
and analyzed and picked apart using state-of-the-art technology. So we enlisted an internationally renowned expert in evidence and crime scene reconstruction to examine that Las Vegas video. And we thought, surely he would have some answers. And he did. They just weren't the answers that we were expecting. I'm going to share his findings next. One thing to squint at a fuzzy video on YouTube and then decide space aliens do or do not exist. And it's another thing entirely to subject those sightings to the same kind of scientific rigor that puts, say, killers in prison. Scott Roeder is that kind of skeptic. He is an evidence expert and crime scene reconstructionist with 33 years of experience and 1,500 cases to his credit. He is the founder of The Evidence Room, a group that assembles specialists in forensic animation, 3D modeling, and motion graphics. He took a close look at the video that was recorded by that family in Las Vegas, and he applied his technology to try to debunk it. Here he is on his YouTube channel, Crime Scene, discussing what he calls the entity in the family's backyard. We can take a video and look at whether or not there is an artificial artifact added to it or not. And in this case, we can definitively say to a degree of scientific certainty that this entity, this thing in the video is there in the physical reality in which the Kenmore family is also there. Like this is so critical because you can clearly see through the slots in the fence that there is a leg motion moving from the right to the left side of the screen. And uh, clearly it is behind there. So this isn't just like a head floating in space. This is a head of a, uh, that is uh, somehow that does not have full opacity, that the opacity of the head of the shadow is only at about 33% opacity versus a normal shadow, which would be at 100% opacity or an object in the screen, which is at 100%. And this isn't anything that you did. It's just what you were able to determine that this shadow being or this being in the shadows possibly creating its own shadow or smoky filter or cloaking uh, a technique uh, is not only cloaking itself from the people there, but cloaking itself from the camera itself in that it's minimizing our ability to identify pixels inside of that shadow. I'm joined now by UFO expert Ben Hansen. He's a former federal agent and now the host of UFO Witness on Discovery+. Plus. Ben, it's great to have you on the program uh, tonight again. So, I mean, your reaction to what, you know, Scott Roeder did with his analytics, uh, the shadow that you saw that was behind the fence as well as way above the fence, I guess your reaction to all of that. Well, uh, thanks, Ashley. Yeah, I'm, I'm excited because um, it, it took a while, I think, for anyone to get a copy of the raw video. I, I don't personally have it, but I'm glad that Scott has done this. Um, I don't detect anything overt as a red flag that I would say that made me suspect that it was edited. So I occur with him um, on that. And it also appears that there is some sort of shadow that's present behind the slats of the fence, which he pointed out. Um, and then you have kind of a, a head, it looks like, at the top of the fence. Um, I, where I kind of feel it, it might be a jump as people online then started to say, well, you know, this is evidence of a, a cloaking creature of some sort. Um, there is a lot going on in the video. If you look, there's two or three different light sources. And anytime time you have that happening, you can have a lot of shadows from different angles. So unfortunately we'll never have the same exact circumstance where we can go back and test it to see what might be causing a shadow effect. There is this one aspect of it, and um, I'm not sure if our producers can just let the video go, but when they walk in past the gate, something startles them and they 
freak out. I mean, for lack of a better description, uh, it's not, it, it, there's no way this is acting. I, you know, actors don't do it this well. Something startles them to the right and they spin around and they kind of run out and, and the, the, the video kind of goes, you know, as it would if you were terrified. It does. And I think that is genuine. Um, if you look at, uh, I think they're looking at something towards the back of the yard and something spooks them where I feel that it might be a little bit of, I don't know, call it forensic gymnastics is to say that it was caused by this thing off to the right, because as you can see right there, um, that shadow appears on top of the fence, but he's not looking to the right. If this was some sort of entity that was like three feet away from him, I think that's what would really scare anybody. So that's where you have these theories that people are saying, well, it's partially cloaked, it's, it's fully cloaked, didn't want to be seen, but only the video did it up. So I, I don't know about that. I, I think um, just based on the video, though, it, it's great that we have verification that it's uh, not been edited. I know you talk about confirmation bias as well. Explain to the audience if, you know, how you think that might be working its way into this as an alternative theory. Well, if you think about it and go back to the original, um, the whole background of what just preceded this, is you had this really bright object that streaked across the sky. Right. And, and I do believe that that now is a meteoroid um, and it may have nothing to do with the family's actual sighting. They believe they saw a light come down to their backyard. And there was a lot of uh, light and commotion, noise. And so that when they went out to the backyard, they're already adrenaline's pumping. Uh, they're hypersensitive to sights and sounds. I'm in no way suggesting that they made anything up, but perception can be skewed now that this is something out of this world we're out to see in our backyard. And then anything that might have a combination of, of shadows or sights they're not used to, um, it can be amplified in your visual perception. And, and this is a suggestion, but I do feel the witnesses are being credible as far as describing what they saw. Um, and especially look at that reaction when they, they see whatever it is back there and they come running out of there and it's affected at least Angel to this day. He, he still has trouble with what he saw. Yeah, and this is not unlike a lot of other reports that we've heard, certainly back in 1973 in Mississippi, same kind of pattern with some people who said they saw something like this um, and it ruined their lives. So, Ben, you're going to stick around with us for a bit and you've got another UFO sighting to tell us about this time on the East Coast. What is it? do um, an amazing UAP video to share for your audience. It was taken by a witness named Michelle Reyes. So she was an afternoon commercial flight coming from New York uh, or to, into New York from Myrtle Beach. End of March. Okay, so she's recording her, her phone with her phone looking out her window at the Narrows Bridge uh, when a dark tic tac tic tac shaped object zips by at an incredible speed. So Michelle wanted answers. She tried to contact the FAA, received no response. Um, I got the video because it was reposted from her social media, but without contact info. And it wasn't until she submitted a report on the UAP app Enigma Labs that we finally got in touch. So I'm excited to share this with everyone, discuss what the object might be. We're going to get into all of that, see the video, and talk to the witness right after the break. I am going to make you a bet that the next time you get a window seat on a plane, uh, you're going to think of this next story, and you're going to think of the guest who is going to talk about this next story. Michelle Reyes was flying over New York City with her daughter, and she was sitting by a window. Um, when she did what a lot of us do, we, you know, take pictures out the window, nice video of the New York skyline. It's an amazing view. But what Michelle did not expect to see was a cylinder-shaped object zipping across her line of sight near LaGuardia Airport. Was it a bug inside the plane maybe well she played the video back to look and no it was not a bug whatever it was it was definitely outside the plane and it was flying on its own and it was really really fast michelle reyes joins me now exclusively and i want to welcome back ben hansen from ufo witness on discovery plus as well michelle thank you so much for being here first of all wow uh that was pretty alarming stuff what did you do with the video, and, and, and did you reach out to authorities to, to share it with them? Um, thank you for having me. And when I realized that I had something like this on the video, the first thing I did was I emailed the FAA to let them know what I saw, and maybe it was a safety hazard. Um, I reached out to them. Unfortunately, I haven't heard back from them. They didn't acknowledge my email. 
Um, and then I sent it to Enigma Labs and the National UFO Database. And any response? Um, Enigma Labs was the only one who responded to me. N so that's your how dad, I got in contact. apparently. Oh, okay. So, and uh, as I understand, your dad is a former Navy guy. So you were able to share with him as well. What did he say? Um, I, yeah, I showed it to him first and he honestly had no idea what it was either. He had no idea. He was just as baffled as I was. Did you guys settle on the fact that it maybe was a, a drone? It was going awfully fast to be a drone, but is that, was that the best guess? He thought it may be a drone, but he didn't think that it should be where it was, that close to the aircraft. Um, so he really didn't have an answer for me. He was just as clueless as I was. He's seen a lot of things, and this he couldn't give me an answer, but if he had to guess, he would have said drone. So it's a good thing Ben Hansen is here, um, you know, you, sh you host a show called UFO Witness. What do you think about this Tic Tac video, Ben? This was incredible, um, honestly, because it, it took a while just for us to get in touch with Michelle. It wasn't for her posting it on the app. Uh, someone had borrowed, sort of uh, stole it from her social media and posted it as if they were her friend. So we had no idea who she was. We were looking up flights and trying to figure out which flight she was on. When we finally were able to contact her, uh, she, for me, has been uh, completely just genuine, sincere. Uh, we've, we, we've now started analyze the video. And I, I feel a little awkward saying this with her here, but <laughs> find no evidence that she faked this or hoaxed it. Uh, I didn't from the beginning, but we had to run it through, you know, the, the proper, uh, you know, data analysis. And it's there. It's, um, it's very clear, uh, which is unusual. Um, so to me, I feel as though this is probably something not terribly far in the distance, but it also there's problems with the theory of it being something as simple as an insect, which I would suspect this was happening, you know, on the ground. We're, we're talking 200 plus miles an hour at this point. Her, her jet is flying. so it passes in about a seventh of a second and it's, it's present in five frames of the video. So there, there's a lot we can dive into. It's also very shiny giant, you know. <laughs> Shiny, giant, really fast insect. It definitely doesn't look like an insect. It certainly looks like the Tic Tacs that we've seen in other naval videos as well. And Michelle, did you say there was, there was someone else maybe on that flight who you later were able to, to determine saw this as well? Yes. Um, I had posted the video onto my social media and one of the other moms on the flight, um, she said that she had noticed it when she was in the air too. So I wasn't the only one who saw it. So it was kind of, you know, a little more like nerve wracking that someone else also saw what I saw. Well, I hope the authorities are watching tonight. And I'm sorry to say, you know, that you didn't get the attention that you should have when you alerted them uh, to videos like this. I think it behooves all of us to just at least forward the information. We don't need to make judgment on it, but for heaven's sake, acknowledge that this is unusual and it certainly does resemble some of the other unusual things we've, we've seen before. Uh, Michelle Reyes, thank you for sharing. Ben Hansen, thank you for your analysis and for also helping us navigate through it. Appreciate both of you. Thank, thank you. you. We'll definitely stay on top of it. Yes, amen to that. I appreciate it. We're not finished with the topic. But I do have this other breaking story. So uh, coming up next, that bombshell announcement in the Oklahoma murder case. He's the fifth suspect, and he is now in custody, in jail, for the murders of Veronica Butler and Jillian Kelly. And police say he has confessed to everything. Soup to nuts. Investigators actually hauled him in weeks ago, and they questioned him but let him go. So what changed? Why is he locked up now with the other four defendants and facing the same murder raps they are? What changed in the weeks between? Details next. Personalized meal guides for your weight loss goals, plus nutrition coaching and support whenever you want it. Join Club Jenny for your 30-day free trial. Text Jenny to 231231 now. The gods misfits. They got some company behind bars tonight in the Oklahoma panhandle. Paul Grice, a.k.a. Mystery Man Number 5, in the murders of Veronica Butler and Jillian Kelly. He was arrested just hours ago on the same charges as all the other misfits, and that is kidnapping 
and murder and conspiracy. Grice is a fellow member of their anti-government religious group called the God's Misfits. Not sure which of the six male pods in that jailhouse Grice is going to be assigned to. But we do know that the sheriff is keeping the men and the women apart and the men apart from the, par- from the men and the women apart from the women just to make sure that they can't conspire and get their story straight. Tad Cullum and Cole Twombly, well, they were in pods one and six, you know, to have as much between them as possible. Paul Gray's going to go in there somewhere. Cora Twombly and Grandma Tiffany, well, they're splitting their time between a woman's pod and a holding cell because there are only two pods and they're next to each other, so they got to keep them separated, so they'll just flip back and forth between sitting in the holding cell and being in the pod. You may have heard that Grandma Tiffany gave a statement, according to the police, indicating her, quote, responsibility in the deaths of the two victims. But it is far, far more clear with Paul Grice. Police say his confession, it is black and white. And it lines up with all the details that the Twombly's 16-year-old daughter told investigators weeks ago about the planning, about the murders, about the burial. She said Grice was a part of everything, start to finish. According to a friend of Paul Grice's, Paul was initially detained and questioned by investigators weeks and weeks ago. But for some reason, they let him go. And then recently we learned this about his anti-government views. Almost exactly one year ago, he filed this crazy 44-page document that reads like a Kaczynski manifesto against the USA, renouncing his US citizenship. But no matter what he believes, US laws apply to Mr. Paul Grice, especially when it comes to murder. The sheriff tells us he's gonna be arraigned week from today, 9 a.m., so mark your calendar. News Nation's senior national correspondent, Brian Enton, is back with me now. So talk to me about this confession, because we heard about Grandma Tiffany's confession, it sounded more like we weren't sure. It was a, she indicated her responsibility. This is entirely different. Yeah, this was much, much clearer, Ashley. We know uh, that investigators were out at Paul Grice's house uh, yesterday, and he lives not very far from where the bodies were discovered, by the way. Uh, He rents a property right in that area. Uh, They went out to talk to him yesterday. What led them to actually go out again Uh, to talk to him. We don't know, but there was this confession, and I want to read it to you because it was much, much more specific and clear than what we uh, saw with the recorded statement from Grandma Tiffany. The confession uh, reads, according to the, uh, the affidavit, Grice was interviewed and admitted that he was a part of the planning and killing of both Butler and Kelly. Grice admitted that he participated in the killing of Butler and Kelly and their subsequent burial. Uh, So they are saying that not only was he connected to the planning, to the actual killing, but then also the burial. And you remember we were out in that area where the bodies were buried, 10 feet down. Uh, It's an area that Paul Grice knows well. Everybody knows each other in that area. And again, uh, the land that he rents where he lives with his family is, is very, very close to that spot. Doesn't get more clear than that. Planning, murder, and burial, uh, police say he's, he's confessing to. It just makes me wonder, is he desperate to give them everything on the other four to try to save his head? This is a death yeah. penalty state. And so if he's got a good lawyer, the lawyer will say, run to the well first and maybe you'll get a good drink and the rest of them will go thirsty. So the other detail that you learned today, you know, as we learn these things, a lot of times there's some shifting in details. We had a source early on that said it looked like they'd been shot. The two women had been shot outside the car. The medical examiner throws water on all of that. Yeah, this is something that I've been trying to nail down for the last couple of days. I heard, uh, I got a tip about it and uh, was trying to get it confirmed by the medical examiner and we finally did. The medical examiner uh, in Oklahoma has confirmed that the two victims uh, that you see right there, um, uh, Veronica and Jillian were Veronica not, and Jillian, uh, yeah. yeah, were not shot. Um, so they were not shot. No gunshot wounds. Uh, this was not a shooting. What the actual cause of death was, we don't know. They're not revealing that yet. Uh, but you know, it's, it's more barbaric than I think that we realized. This could possibly be an explanation. You remember, they didn't positively identify the bodies for a couple of days. It took them a couple of days. Uh, and, and this may be maybe a reason why it may have really just been a very a brutal killing, Ashley. 
It's so upsetting to, I mean, there's nothing, nothing that can make you feel uh, better about this story, but for the fact that you hope that they died quickly yeah. and painlessly, and maybe it was a bullet they didn't even see coming. But given these details, that there was a broken hammer found with the glasses behind the, the vehicle, um, and that they weren't shot, it just makes you wonder, did, were they beaten to death? Did they use a hammer? Were they strangled? I mean, it could not, and there were two of them, and apparently, potentially five with stun guns, mm. keeping them, you know, um, yeah, it's just an awful, awful series. Last thing real quickly, um, why was he released? Why was Paul Grice brought in and released and then grabbed again after the other four? It's a big mystery. Yeah, it's a very, very good question, and we don't know the answer. Uh, again, he was, he was not brought in. Uh, he, was, he didn't go in on his own the first time. He was brought in almost like he was going to be arrested. They did the interviews, uh, and they, then they released him. What they've learned between then and now, we don't know. I will say I've been talking to locals on the ground there. Um, not totally shocked, obviously, by this arrest since he was in the affidavit to begin with, but a lot of sadness because he's got three kids, too. Um, and you know that you know now they've they've got to sort all of that out. So uh, the whole community is still very much torn apart over all this. I can imagine, and there's still so much more to come. Brian, it's an excellent reporting today. Thank you so much for this. Thanks. Really appreciate you staying late. Thanks, Alrighty. Ash. Coming up, we're going to take you back to our other top story: a family in Las Vegas finally breaking their silence about what they saw in their backyard one year ago, something otherworldly that coincided with many reports of UFO sightings that night. Their early description was an eight-foot-tall creature with big, shiny eyes and a big mouth just lurking in the shadows. But now the family says the unexplained did not stop there. That's next. Okay, sure, the truth is out there. But are we any closer to actually finding it? We have never been better at exploring and investigating and speculating. But we're all still waiting for the big reveal like a UFO landing in Central Park or Buckingham Palace or the Champs-Élysées, right? In broad daylight with thousands of witnesses, maybe Times Square. Until then, we've got a lot more information to unpack from that Vegas encounter, including more of our exclusive interview with the family and then also more of those bizarre details on the supposed paranormal activity that has apparently been haunting this family ever since that night inside the house, not in the backyard. You're going to see all of it right here on this program tomorrow. It's all I have for tonight. So I want you to live long and prosper. But tomorrow night, also, alien abduction syndrome. It's a thing. We'll see you tomorrow. Fun was next. We just can't allow this kind of hatred and anti-Semitism to flourish on our campuses, and it must be stopped in its tracks. Those who are perpetrating this violence should be arrested. Hey, everybody, I'm Brian Enton filling in for Chris Cuomo tonight. Uh, that was Speaker of the House Mike Johnson on the campus of Columbia University earlier today.